Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to Doctor Who Reviews. This week we are looking at The Haunting of Villa Diodati, written by Maxi Nordson, and uh, focusing on Mary Shelley and uh, Percy Shelley and Lord Byron in their villa as they, the knights that Frankenstein, damn it, Frankenstein, because you said Frankenstein at the beginning and it threw me off. Uh, <laughs> the night that Frankenstein, perhaps the world's greatest ghost story, was conceived. Oh, we're leaving that in, are we? <laughs> and joining me to talk about this are my two usual co-hosts. Firstly, Every time the doctor walks in the room, you hear a horse neigh. <laughs> firstly, to my virtual left, he's creepy and he's kooky. It's Freezing Inferno. You rang. And to my virtual right, she's altogether loony. It's Cat. Yes. I was about to say, apparently tonight, the part can we play by the Infinite Void. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, this this certainly was an episode, my God. It was, it was good. It was good in places, I think. It's a two-act structure. Usually we have a three-act structure, but here it's, it's definitely a two-act structure. The first half of the episode is basically various ghostly shenanigans going on with the Doctor and company and the, the patrons of the villa... And the second half is not that. I like that. I like that description. And the second half is not that. Yes, basically. Honestly, this is one of Jodie's stronger performances, but it's also kind of like, for my money anyway, one of the weaker written Doctor performances. Like she's she's good in spite of the material here, rather than because of it. Go on. Well, she yes. just comes across as a bit of a hypocrite, doesn't she? Doctor Who is a hypocrite? I never. But this this goes back to series 11, where there was like a flexible moral structure to Jodie's Doctor, and she was like, oh, right, we're not going to interfere, and then the next episode, she's there <laughs> running in to interfere. Now she's, well, she's, I mean... <laughs> she is presented with an impossible choice this week. It really yeah. is an impossible choice. It's... We'll, we'll get more on that choice. We will, we will get to the to the, uh, the thorny problem of the trolley, but um, oh god, yeah, there's there's a lot to unpack there. But I don't know if it's entirely hypocritical. Like the idea of the doctor here is consistent with most of what we've seen in historicals. The whole yeah. oh, the arc of human history is sacrosanct. To a quote from William Hartnell, you can't rewrite history in not one line, which is a little more extreme than Doctor Who these days, but is kind of an edict the Chibnall era generally follows. You have stuff like Rosa and Spyfall Part 2 with the goddamn mind wipes oh. begrudgingly. Well, I mean, I kind of liken it to a puppy where the doctor comes in, all right, guys, whatever we do, we cannot change the course of time. It is imperative that you don't... Hey, look, shiny. Yeah. So the dog from Up. Yes. And we... <laughs> Okay, I can't. I can't see that now. I can't see the thirty dogs as dog from up. Thanks for that, cat. Uh, squirrel. <laughs> oh, that's but why yeah, somebody I mentioned mean... squirrel the other night, right? <laughs> I get it. But I mean, it, it, it's just what she does. It's what the doctor does in general. So I don't really see it, it as her being hypocritical because she didn't come right out and say, "Hey, don't you feel like writing this story that has all these specific plot elements?" She alluded to elements no. of typical horror, but she didn't come out and say, hey, write a damn story about somebody who m builds a body. She she so. claims she claims does she not that she's only doing it to, to move things back to how they should be because something's wrong. Well, to be fair, they were kind of just about to start it when all of a sudden the Doctor and her companions came in, so... Yes. She did kind. Of, uh, they did kind of, you know, like uh, derail the the plot train. Well, one can also say that the uh, lack of Percy Shelley being there is also a diversion from "quote unquote" accepted history. Let's be fair. Any time the Doctor does a historical episode, mm -hmm. it's always a diversion from history. Oh well, yes, absolutely. <laughs> 
Unless you're talking about, like, well, no, no, even in the William Hartnell era, it was like, oh, this is not. <laughs> the the but, simple existence of the Doctor being there is exactly. from history. Yeah. Ex yes. Exactly, exactly. I gotta give you that one. Doctor Who does tend to try and portray its history as histor historically accurate to a point, but also factor in the, the science fiction and the fun elements as well. Mm -hmm. And have a, such a, in such a way that they don't, they don't contradict each other. They don't. Um, what's the word I'm looking for? Really one doesn't clash with the one other. Meshes together well. That's it. Mesh. Yeah. Mesh is a good is a good term. Yeah, they're gonna That's they're gonna mesh together. They're gonna blend together in the mm. right way. And I think for the most part, this one does it. Love the uh, the look of the episode. It looks gorgeous. It's very atmospheric, which I like. I like atmospheric, spooky. In my even doctor. even though the staircase has been seen before, because it's it's Jackie Tyler's mansion from Rise of the Cybermen. <laughs> Holy shit! What? It really is Jackie Tyler's mansion. Oh, oh my, my god! god. Some, someone on the internet did a comparison shot, like one shot of, of the other. It's absolutely the same set. <laughs> <laughs> I have that, or they they, that they, they designed to look exactly like Jackie Tyler's mansion, but no, they probably just filmed an old house. Could have been, who knows? <laughs> yeah, but it, it it did look really stunningly good looking with all the lighting and the atmos the atmosphere. It's a very atmospheric episode. Yeah, it was beautiful in the atmosphere. So uh, should we talk about the haunted house part? Now or oh the Scooby Doo yeah. work the Scooby Doo house yeah <laughs> <laughs> well that's that's not exactly what I was thinking of but that's... I love the Scooby Doo house that's great well I mean let's be fair the last time they introduced Scooby Doo elements into Doctor Who it didn't go well I know what you're thinking of I don't because yeah. I'm slow on the uptake love and monsters <laughs> ruh oh yeah ruh oh Ooh. Ooh. Ted yes. slap chicken. Yeah, you're right. Ted and, and Rose chasing that monster, and that was like straight out of Scooby Doo. Well, to be, to be fair, that was like an unreliable narration from Elton, so. Yes. But still. Still. But still. No, but the, the big thing that popped up for me, and this is all, again, personal. It's a lot like Can You Hear Me in that regard, is that the personal resonances with me. One of my favorite books of all time. Is House of Leaves by Mark my, by Mark Z. Danieluski. That was a bit of a mouthful of a name, and it's a really interesting book because, uh, actually, thinking on it and writing on my thing, its narrative structure kind of mirrors another famous book that you might have heard of. It was by Mary Shelley and was called Frankenstein. <laughs> yeah, like. And, and this is me, this is the one thing I learned from college, is that Frankenstein has this narrative nesting structure. You know, you've got the letters, a letter from the old man on the sailing ship in the beginning, and then a letter from, it's been like 15 years, but there's a letter from this guy, there's a letter from that guy, and then there's maybe the account of the creature in there in the, in the middle as well, you know, like a matryoshka doll sort of thing. Yeah. A nest of narrative structure. House of Leaves is the same way. It's, it's a book about a manuscript about a movie, about a fucked up house. And the fucked up house is bigger on the inside and has this massive labyrinth inside it that uh, it's pitch black and the walls continually change and keep you locked in there and disorient you and stuff, which mm -hmm. is exactly what the house in the the haunting in the house of a Villa Diodad this place does. Yes. Which, Isn't the um, House of Leaves book also the one that has, like, the crazy writing in it? It does. Like, it does. It's got, like, stuff. absolute bonkers fucking footnotes, which is really great, too. Was which, it ever adapted, House of Leaves? Adapted into what? A film, TV show. I don't think so, no. I don't know if you could adapt. Yeah, I don't know how it's you would do the it. Best way. Oh, they, they've tried this to is adapt the on best adaptation. Believe me, they've tried to adapt on adaptable novels before. It hasn't worked out very well, but they tried it before. I can't imagine what the house. Of yeah, Leaves trust me, like. I know. Ink heart. <laughs> not <laughs> quite where I was going mad. with that. Not quite where I was going <laughs> with that, but yes. Yeah, no, but that was still uh, that still stuck with me. Now, mind you. This is another thing I poked at with uh, Captain Jack's appearance in Futures of the Jadoon. Reminding me of a good thing 
isn't the same as being a good thing yourself. So I was sitting there like, oh, that's impressive. And also, oh, I hope there's something to this beyond just, hmm, it's a spooky house and it's like House of Leaves. Which there kind of was, I guess. Kind of. Acceptable enough that I can not feel like pandered to. I mean, unlike the whole Captain Jack thing, this probably isn't an obvious reference. It's just my dumb brain connecting two things I like. But yeah. it was still I interesting th- enough I that I had to mention. that's definitely what it is. Because the, the explanation of the story is that it's layers of the house being put together. So it makes sense for them to essentially be trapped in one room because of their own minds rather than, you know, <laughs> them being literally trapped in the room. <laughs> I do love the bit where, uh, what's Dr. What, what's his name? Polidori. Pop Polidori sleepwalks through a wall, and Graham is telling the doctor, Graham, you have one job! And Graham basically, in his way, well, he says it more eloquently, but he basically says, the bitch walked through the wall! <laughs> she even says you have one You have one job, which is even funnier. You have one job! That literal <laughs> sentence, you had one job. Oh, God. My favorite is when uh, Lord Byron and... Um... It was it Claire in the room with her with him? Claire Claremont. And the doctor just kept trying to trying to run back out and kept running back in, and you can see they look so exasperated. She's still trying. Oh, the, the best one about that is when she thinks she's going to the outside, runs in, hits her head on the <laughs> invisible <laughs> wall. Amazing. <laughs> she's like, I'm out! Bang! <laughs> I guess I filled in the plot hole of why don't they just leave through the windows? If you cared about that. No, because it would have been they wouldn't be able to get out of the windows either. That was explained. That wasn't a pothole. Oh, okay, okay. Well, the, I, the house I, would have not let like, her out. The house yeah. needed to keep them in. Exactly. We'll get to what's controlling the house later on when we get to the uh, the conclusion and the resolution. Because oh my Which, god, I've got words to say about that. But um, whatever's controlling the house, I. whatever's mm. controlling the house, is basically keeping everybody in for an unknown reason. Well, it's, uh, it's both keeping everything in and trying to keep things out. Yes. So it's a little bit of both. It's almost like um, the main plot point, since we're not on that yet, is trying to keep everybody in the house safe. Yeah. Hmm. But I did enjoy the first 20, 25 minutes of the episode really quite a bit. It was atmospheric. It was funny. Um, Corey got a bone hand. It, it, oh, no, no, no. It misdirected me no. quite quite nicely, because I thought at first, right, this footman keeps appearing and disappearing at will. He's a ghost. Mm. He wasn't a ghost. He was an actual footman. Mm. Then I thought, hmm, Dr. Polidori, he seems a bit strange. Is he, like, not real? Are none of these people actually going to be real? Is it going to turn out to be, like, a simulation? Or are they yeah, robots? I was, Is this Westworld? I was West thinking that, too. I that was thinking it. that they were, like, I, I was thinking it was sort of like a thing where they were, like, trapped in the doctor's dream that that not dr polidori not doctor who trapped in his dreamscape yeah some something well, like I that mean, it, it wasn't that you no, do but... know what polidori is famous for right no i do not please enlighten me he's credited as the creator of vampires Ooh. yes so literally his whole act is ex- almost exactly like a vampire he doesn't sleep that well he always looks really grumpy He's credited as the, as the creator of vampires. Take that, Bram Stoker. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, you don't get to call Bram, Bram Stoker that. Come on, now, be fair. <laughs> it wasn't. It wasn't Doctor Polidori who wrote Dracula. Now, come on. <laughs> Whether or not he came up with vampires or not is irrelevant. Bram Stoker did write Dracula. <laughs> so, so Doctor Polidori is spinning in his grave over sparkling. Oh my oh. god. For us, I'm not even dead yet and I'm spinning in my grave. Right yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that might be one of my favorite utterances ever on this podcast. Not, not gonna lie, that's brilliant. Oh god, that's magical. <laughs> okay. All right. Yeah, I think that's a good way to tell us to, to, to get back in line. <laughs> A back yeah, on topic let's, here. Let's, let's get back in. Yeah, so the, the main on. the main uh, points of topic I want to talk about this week are the guest actors and the the monster. So before we get to that, let's just get to the companion bits. Uh, yes, in particular, little... is very interesting here. Mm. She's continuing this this um, 
this recent trend of being the one that gets stuff done. She's the one that's... Wow, um, it, it's almost like she's being, like, pushed to the front or something. Like she's getting the most character or something like it's, that. It's, it's almost like she's a police officer. Uh, it's almost it's as almost if they're like planning they're on setting making... up for something bad to happen. Oh, God. Yes, I agree. I, I think Ryan's going to leave the series in two weeks' time. Can I just say how uh, kind of fucked up it was that Dr. Polidori was going to duel Ryan there and then? Oh, that was, that was, that was funny, though. <laughs> It was a little fucked up. It's just, it was just like, oh, oh my god, this guy's going to get a fucking gun. Yeah, and then he tried to get a gun and couldn't. <laughs> well, thank God for that. What was it? A hand or a hand pistol? I guess he was going to like it was a he dueling the door, pistol. He falls in. back scared, and, and suddenly the jewel is forgotten about. But <laughs> I can't remember what what what's about him. when the the hand the bone hand. Bone hand. Choke Ryan. Oh, the bone hand! My God. Cory got a bone oh hand. Oh god, that thing freaked me the fuck out. It came out of the painting and I thought it was a giant ass spider and I was like, no! It I moves it was so creepily. It, it gets worse when you when you realize the bone hand wasn't actually properly explained. <laughs> oh no! Thing's not getting explained. Yes, yes, I know, I know. <laughs> but she, she I mean, takes I'm charge fine here. With that. Yeah, yes, mm-hmm. takes charge here. She even defies the doctor, or she's prepared to defy the doctor, in order to help her. Yeah, when the second act, you said we couldn't follow her, and she's yeah. right. Even though yeah. they they do technically follow her and end up in the same place, which kind of ruins that whole thing. But I mean, it didn't fuck up anything in the end, did it? No, no, the doctor was doing that all by herself. Yeah, that's a bit that's a bit too harsh, considering. Is it? Bro? <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean. But I mean, no, you guys was... can see my point from last week, right? They put Yaz to the forefront. She's starting to look for loopholes in what the Doctor says. She is becoming far more Doctor-like, more Clara-like, more Donna-like. You know, she's becoming. I am getting worried. I have, to, I have like, to admit, I think you're onto something here. I mean, she I'm... has to be the <clears> one. <throat> if she if she's not the one, this is the biggest red herring that Chibnall has ever made. I'm now thinking Six. it's two. I'm thinking it's two that go. <laughs> Like a, Either this is a red herring or something smells fishy. Oh. Like a, here's the thing. Um, nice. When, when they did this with Clara and they killed her and faced the raven, I mean, Moffat and co. were smart enough not to just go, well, she got too big for her. Her ego got too big and she got killed because she wanted to be the doctor. But she can't because nobody can be the doctor. That'll show her. And they just made her literally into the doctor. <laughs> exactly. Like they, they did that twist and made it like brilliant. I don't, I don't, I don't. I'm going to be honest, even though Series 12 has been a step up above Series 11, I don't trust Chibnall to pull that second thing. I, I think if yeah. he does go with, well, Yaz got killed by a Cyberman or some shit. Oh, isn't that bad? Oh, she was she was, she was, was getting pretty, like, you know, she was getting all daring and finding loopholes. I That'll kill her. I don't think it'll be that. It'll either be a self-sacrifice for the good of everything, which kind of ties into what Ryan said in this episode. Or mm-hmm. she will just get close enough to the point where she's like, I have a family. I'm in uh, constant danger all the time. I'm going home. I, I would like a more Martha, like, leaving for Yaz, sort of. Or, well, what you described is more like a classic Doctor Who thing, Tegan leaving, where she's just, after one last big bloody adventure with the Daleks where a shitload of people die, she's just like, it's not fun anymore. I'm out. It's funny you mentioned Tegan because that's what I think is going to happen. That's what I think is going to happen with Ryan. Oh, I think that, Ryan that gets is... the Tegan exit. Ryan gets the Tegan exit. It's not fun anymore. I'm out. Well, he already. He... If something bad happens to Yaz, then he'll get that. He he oh. already. You, you're determined for, for Yaz is the one, aren't you? You just. <laughs> it makes I'm, sense. I'm, it, I'm like 95 percent positive she is the one who either something big is going to happen. Or she's going to do something that'll make her leave. Can I mention something else about? I, I the, even uh, gave you an outcome. I even said two are leaving. In my opinion, he said no, no, it's one. It's one. <laughs> okay. There, there's one thing I. Maybe. Uh, there's one Sorry, thing I really it. liked uh, when the doctor is saying, "Don't follow me," because it's Cyberman. And well, I don't know if Alderton and Chibnall. I mean, Chibnall doesn't have a co-write on this, but. I don't know if the writers had this in mind, but I don't think Capaldi actually found out Bill technically lived through 
world enough in time to Dr. Falls. She de- he, he definitely didn't because Bill is mentioned in the episode. Oh, they actually mentioned Bill? I must have missed Well, that. no. It's when, she, when the Doctor says, I will not lose anyone else to the cyber conversion. Yeah, exactly. Okay, yeah. So but in the behind-the-scenes was... video, Jody specifically name-dropped Bill. Okay, so they did have that in mind. So that's what they were thinking of. Good. Yeah. I, I, re- I really like that, that she's just defiantly saying, no, she remembered Bill. and like, no, you have to stay here. I have to protect you. I can't fail again. I think it's more than just Bill. She's lost a lot of people to cyber people. Yeah, like Adric and... Well, specific to cyber conversion, though, we've got Danny Pink and Bill. Well, hmm. don't forget about... Um... In the alternate universe where uh, Rose eventually stayed. Oh yeah, Jackie as well, but he didn't really know that version of Jackie. No, but he didn't even like Jackie. Got converted. Yeah. Yes, true. And mm. a whole lot of people got converted, but yes. Yes. When she says I refuse to lose anyone else, I think she means anyone else that she cares about, that, that travels with her, that she knows mm. intimately. That's true. Either way, it was a nice resonance and something that I liked it. Yeah. But so, she, uh, um, yeah, they are building something. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm almost certain of it now. Oh, yeah, it's gonna be. I don't know if it's gonna be good. I mean, I'll, we're just on the Chibnall train from here on out, so we just gotta hold on. If tight. she is gonna leave, yeah. at least um, the the Phasmin people will be happy again because there was a nod to that particular ship uh, this week. Hmm. Yes, this conversation with Claire, Claire Claremont. Where Claire's talking about Lord Byron and Yasmin's talking about someone else. <laughs> doctor Who shipping alert. Yes, she was talking about the doctor. Yes. She was clearly talking about the doctor. That is the only acceptable relationship here. Fasman is real. <laughs> oh, God. Hashtag Fasman is real. Don't actually hashtag that, please. Uh, I do not want to be responsible for that. Uh, Oh, you're well, too late. Either, either way, I will concede that there is a possibility that Ryan could also go. There's even a possibility that Graham could also go. Oh, frequently. Uh, in my heart and in my mind, I think that Yaz will be either the reason other people go, or she'll just be the, her own reason that she goes. We, we could have a completely clean slate for Series 13. We don't know yet. This is also true. Mm-hmm. Ryan gets some interesting of- character bits as well. They actually remember to hear this dyspraxia again, sort of. The piano scene. Mm. He's there playing the piano for Mary Shelley. <laughs> He's playing chopsticks for Mary <laughs> Shelley. See, the joke there is that everyone that has learned to play piano plays chopsticks. That's cute. It's like the go to song. <laughs> it's like in America, we learned to play the recorder. The very first song we learned to play is always Hot Cross Bun. Oh, okay. yeah. Always. You see, see, you say learn to play, and then you mention the recorder. <laughs> Don't diss the recorder. I played that a long, long time ago. <laughs> but did you play it well? I played the recorder a long time ago. Case in point. We learned how to annoy our parents with the recorder. There was an attempt. Let's put it that way. <laughs> an attempt was made. <laughs> But the, the, the biggest um, development with Ryan, I think, is when uh, he says, oh, you know, let this one man die. And the doctor looks shocked and hurt. Oh, God. But Ryan still looks like, have I really just said that? Is that the scene being played for his exit? I don't know. I don't know about a lot of this. Well, we're going to get to that scene. <laughs> he seems to be the one who's questioning her the most, I so... Think- hmm. If, if I can get a little bit, um, I'm going to delve into the fandom side that likes to theorize and come up with the wild analogies that couldn't possibly tr- be true. So I'm going to go for a little Tumblr on this. Oh, no. Ryan is Lonnie. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Not that far. Not that far. But right. this could be sort of a culmination of everything that Ryan has gone through where he's lost at least one person in certain adventures. Like, he lost his grandmother, Grace. And then he lost um, that chick from Orphan 55. 
Bella. Bella. Yes, thank you. Um, but this could could all be not only the idea that you can lose somebody to save others, but it also could be an idea of what he's most afraid of is just, you know, losing people. And it's like, he, I mean, would, we... he knows that if he just sacrifices this one person, then his people will be safe. I will also add to that, the, the, we know he's afraid of losing people because we saw it last week. I, I don't know. It's just one of those things where it feels like Ryan has gone full Spock almost. You know, the needs of the many outweigh the needs of the few or the one. That's I'm gonna exactly have... What he's going for. Yeah, I'm, I'm definitely gonna poke at that when we get to this scene in full. Yeah. <laughs> Believe me. We're not too far away from that. But yeah, that that is a very accurate portrayal of his view that we should sacrifice Shelly to save these billions from the cyber whatever the holy fuck yeah it's like his worldview is what most humans worldview is it's their immediate surroundings um mm -hmm. it's sort of like the same idea that most people have when it comes to like certain events like oh that happened halfway across the world it has nothing to do with me oh that happened mm -hmm. in the next town over it's got nothing to do with me but as soon as it becomes more immediate then all of a sudden they start caring a lot yeah Mm. He's not looking so, at the bigger picture here, is he? Yeah, he's seeing what he sees every day. He sees his friends, his loved ones, being in danger. The doctor sees literally everything. Mm. She sees the entire tapestry while Ryan is only looking at one section. Mm -hmm. Which kind of makes what happens at the end of this even worse, but yeah. <laughs> well... Can you really fault Ryan for that, though? Because that's just how humans are. We are naturally very selfish. I'm not following Ryan now. No. no. And he just, seems to look like, oh, he just seems to look like I said, like, oh, did I really just say that? He looks like I was shocked at himself. Mm. There's just a little glance down yeah, that he because, gives at the floor. I mean, if you were in that situation and there was someone who's, like, threatening your friends and family who are in the same room as you, and all you have to do is give up this one guy, wouldn't you do the same? Yeah. It's, it's a very uh, human That's, thought uh, process, isn't it? It's pretty fucked up when you have to think about it on that term. No. This entire episode is messed up, though. Well, really. Yeah, yeah. But before we get to that, we and should get just to... Really, uh, Graham, Graham doesn't really do a, a whole lot in this episode, unfortunately. He's, he's back to comic yeah. relief duty. I did enjoy oh, him I, trying to fit in at the beginning. I, I like Graham in this one, though. He's got some good funny ones. And he, he quotes the wrong author. <laughs> Who's he quote? Uh, Jane Austen. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay. I, I thought that it was a... I didn't know because I haven't read Frankenstein since college, so I thought he was quoting it in the Dr. Tripoli. He's trying up. to quote Lord Byron's poetry at him. <laughs> <laughs> and he ends up quoting Pride and Prejudice instead. <laughs> okay, that's incredible. I think it was Lord Byron's poetry. It was someone's poetry. It might have been Shelley's, but the point is he was trying to fit in with this... With this uh, this literally um, highbrow crowd and completely messes it up. Oh, that's amazing. <laughs> that's Pete Graham, though. Oh. That's Pete. He, he gets some good bits here and there, but he, he largely doesn't contribute that much to the overall uh, plot. No. He's still funny, though. But our guest ca uh, characters certainly do. We have four of them this week. Oh, boy. Percy mm. Bysshe Shelley, Mary Shelley, Claire Claremont... No, sorry, five of them. Uh, Dr. Polidori and Lord Bloody Byron. Oh, boy. Okay, can I just say right off the, right off the bat, he was a highlight for me yeah. here. He can, I just, can I just say right off the bat, Lord Byron is a fuckboy. He yes. is. <laughs> he is. But it's kind of true to form. <laughs> oh, it's historically accurate, sure, but that doesn't change the fact. That he was described as bad, bad, and dangerous to know, and, and sums him up perfectly here. Uh, like, what he, a... he just goes all apeshit over yeah. the doctor, and that's ja the funniest thing. Jacob Collins Levy, uh, chapeau to you, sir. You did a fantastic job here. jeez. Oh, However, um, shout out to Claire Claremont for that ending bit where she just tells him to fuck off. The spell is broken by law. <laughs> <laughs> that was fucking awesome. That was great. 
so was uh, so was Byron flirting with with the doctor, the doctor having none of it. <laughs> God Almighty! And can I say one of the funniest scenes for me was when they all, uh, you know, go into the room, they start dancing, and immediately every single one of them starts gossiping about the others. Yes. <laughs> <It's amazing. laughs> I don't like oh. to gossip, but blah. And again, that's probably not entirely uh, inaccurate with Victorian society. <laughs> oh, that's completely where Victorian society A, a lot was of gossip about. took place in, in, during dances like that. Uh, they a were lot kinky motherfuckers, too. <laughs> of gossip. <laughs> But and no, I, I think Byron was brilliant. Um, he he uses Claire as a human shield at one point. <laughs> yeah, I guess. I guess, and that's why she tells him. That's what um, that's what uh, gets her to leave him in the end. <laughs> but plus the whole, you know, flirting with another woman in full view of her. Like I said, fuck boy. <laughs> and he knew it. <laughs> he he knew it. This was like, oh, it's a mistake. No, he knew what he was doing. <laughs> She's like listing all this horrible stuff, and he's just like. Okay, and? Yes. And then she, she returns with, and the spell is broken, my lord. He's like, yep, yeah, see ya. Keep <coughs> the curve. Friend zone. Oh, wow. Out of here. Friend zone. Jeez. Plus, if I have this right, this is not too long after he split up with his wife, and his wife has Anna current. So, yes. he's in that period of time where he's starting to go kind of insane. It's 1816. Mm. But I will yeah. say, they did mention the bear he had at university once, 0 out of 10. Uh, mm. But the bear could show bear. up in this episode, because that would not be historically accurate, but they could have just mentioned he had a bear. Oh, 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 sure, oh, sure. The episode where Mary Shelley gets attacked by an alien Cyberman from outer space can't add the bear, because it wouldn't be historically but the, accurate. the characters themselves... <laughs> the characters themselves are... At that point in time, mostly historically accurate. And we're going to let you in on a little secret, look, okay? Look, yeah. I know exactly what I'm going to let you in on a little secret. This is all made up bullshit. <laughs> I thought you were going to say I'm wrong, but that's the, the little secret. But uh... Look, we, we all know they already have an explanation for the bear. He went back to his home planet with Poochie. Oh, God. <laughs> So, uh, I just thought when, when they were talking about Lord Byron and Mary's show that the gang were talking about as they went into the house, they could have brought the bear, okay? Okay. They could have brought the bear. Uh, so should we talk about Mary Shelley? Because uh, Samson, Oh, this... yeah, this is a problem. <laughs> oh, are we going to bring up the same thing? Uh, does it do her lack of agency? It's kind of. <laughs> or rather that she's fine for about half the episode and then something happens and it ruins her. <clears throat> Something happens, eh? Yeah, something happens. Oh, one thing I should point out is that the, um, I, I've said, you know, it's historically accurate, and this right is clear to her homework here, but she gets mm -hmm. one thing slightly wrong. It wasn't a night that the ghost writing contest, uh, sorry, the ghost story contest took place over. It was three days. Oh, yeah. But they wanted to, you know, push it onto a single night for dramatic license, and that's, that's fair enough. Another thing let's, is that... Let's um, be fair, this is just day one, so they might have been other days that they decided to yes. go ahead and write it out. These these when... people are very young at this moment in history. Mary's 18, uh, Percy Bysshe Shelley's not much older than that. She's already eloped with him two years previous at the age of 16. They haven't quite got married yet, so she's still Mary Wollstonecraft, I think. Godwin. She's credited as that in the credits, actually. Which one? Wollstonecraft or Godwin? Worcestercraft. Yeah. Well, she's known as Mary Godwin in the actual thing, so... Yes. Yes. But the point is, these are young people. So they did the right thing, and they cast rather young-looking, or actually young actors. Mm -hmm. And for the most part, they do a good job. Yeah. And then we get to Mary Shelley. All right, what happened? Now, what Mary is an like? interesting one, because this is not her first foray into the world of Doctor Who. Oh, we're going to bring this up? Okay. I think we have to, because this was oh, quite, yeah, well. uh, quite a hot topic um, when the episode aired. Yeah. Well, so, um, go ahead. I'll just come out and say it. This is not the first time Mary Shelley's in Care the Cyberman. I've heard of this one. It was okay. The From Silver Boy Turk, Robert. Big Finish audiobook, has Mary Shelley mm -hmm. traveling with the Eighth Doctor, and they encounter um, either the Cyberman or a Cyberman. Uh, I haven't heard I it. I forget. I haven't heard I, it. I forget. So... 
Yeah, I forget if there was one or multiple. I'm now, this is not so much of a problem because the stories where she's traveling with the Doctor, they took place after <clears throat> this, after 1816, so they're still canon. That's not a problem. But uh, there's another I... audio adventure, mm -hmm. Mary's Story. Mm -hmm. And Mary's Story is a problem because that gives an alternative explanation for how Mary was inspired to write Frankenstein. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm, oh, no. The lore! The lore is out of control! Yes, because, I mean, the lore of Doctor Who has never done anything like, oh, pff, I don't know. Three no, of course hours. they have. I just thought it was an interesting topic of conversation. <laughs> Chindle. Anyway, in that story, the Eighth Doctor turns up at the villa on the same day as this one is set, calling himself Dr. Frankenstein. <laughs> oh my god! That's, that's, really? That's a hilarious... Hey, you? You slammed on the 13th Doctor for being hypocritical. Dude. I didn't slam her. I didn't slam her. It was a statement. You did in the chat before we actually started recording. It was a so. statement I'm beginning to regret rapidly, but it was a statement. <laughs> oh, God. Now, well, here, here's the thing. Besides the lore, uh, the one thing that I think we, people might have feelings on, uh, the idea that the Lone Cider Man inspires Mary Shelley. Frankenstein. Uh, well, I was fine with that. I don't I mean, know. It, it pretty much it. is entirely the story of Frankenstein right there. <clears throat> I don't know how I feel about made up alien bullshit inspiring real history, real literature like that. It's like the Colin Baker actually did something like this before, and it was also kind of silly. And the yet, story... at least she comes up with the. Uh, inspiration herself when she sees the Cyberman. Yeah. I, I did. I did kind of have a little mark out moment when she said the modern Promethean. So I was like, "Oh, that's the thing." Yeah, oh, some people didn't like okay. that. But they, they didn't realize that the modern Prometheus. She's not referring to the Cyberman. Yeah. The modern Prometheus is, is is the Cyberman's creator. Exactly. <laughs> because Doctor that's... Frankenstein. Because spoilers. That's the name of the of the man that creates the monster, and not the monster. The monster's actual name is Adam. Huh. Named after the biblical first man, but um, yeah. yeah, Frankenstein is the modern Prometheus, not is that, yeah, not it's the monster, like, not the yeah, monster, it's... because he gives life to he, he gives life to something, My just as how Prometheus gave still... fire to the humans. Mm -hmm. My favorite joke about this book is still Doctor Frankenstein enters a bodybuilding contest right. and he severely misunderstands. <laughs> it's a good joke that. <laughs> The funniest part is all the comments from people who are like, but Frankenstein was the monster. I don't understand. No, no, no. He's not the monster. It's Frankenstein's You You fools, like, watch QI. QI quite clearly states that Frankenstein is not the monster. Well, let's be fair. He does make the monster, so doesn't that technically make him also? Because Stephen Fry manages to catch people out some... Um, twice he says what color was frankenstein they say green and then the, the klaxon goes off and say no actually frankenstein was a monster what color was frankenstein's monster green the klaxon goes off again because he wasn't green either no the monster wasn't even green no the only reason he would have been green is because and this is a film fact for all you people out there um this was something that they also did in the adams family show where green when it's on a black and white screen comes up as very very pale so yeah. what they would do is they painted uh him green and they also painted morticia green so then that way she would come up as very very pale if you find pictures of the original set it's very pink inside because those colors come out best on black and white absolutely i, I can't remember what color the, the frankenstein's monster actually is in the book but it's not green well i'm pretty sure it's the same color as rot and pus and gross so he'd be Since gray? was a dead body. Gray or black? No, not green, but some sort of like... No, gray, gray, not green, gray. Gray, and yeah. Yeah. No, we've already established he, he wasn't green. <laughs> Either way, it would be really obvious to tell that something's not... Yes. Uh, by the way, the best line of this entire episode for me, it made me absolutely raw, given from where I'm, I am actually from. Uh, Lord Byron says to, about the Doctor, she is from somewhere much, much stranger. And Doctor Paul Dory says, the North, and then the thunderclap the happens. <laughs> <laughs> I absolutely was... roared. 
Beautiful. The Foot Day Club is just a perfect cherry on top of that cake. <laughs> uh, He's so deadpan too. You can hear he meant it. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not sure who's the bigger asshole, Doctor Polidori or Lord Byron, but uh, <laughs> Byron. No spoilers. It's Lord Byron. <laughs> it's very much yeah. Lord Byron. I mean, look. No, one there's of, no spoilers one, there. You can tell immediately. It's Byron. One of these people. One of those characters was ready and willing to shoot a man. The other is Lord Byron. <laughs> Well, to be fair, Lord Byron might have shot a man as well. We don't know. Yeah, well, well he might have. But... Like he might have actually shot a man in real life. We, yeah. we don't well, know. I don't know. There were well, rumors he had, he had killed someone. Byron was insane. The other dude was just sleep deprived. So. Yes, but his sleepwalking does give the key to the mystery about the house. When he just ups and walks through the wall. Bitch, walk through a wall. <laughs> And then he was like, how did I get up here? I was downstairs. I'm like, what? <laughs> yeah, that, that, was all, that was all good, well and good. But then, so the first half is all this, this sort of fun ghost romp. And these two weird figures show up. And this weird shit that's going on. And then they notice a figure outside. And things turn really rapidly. Because this figure is glowing with electricity. And, god damn it, it's the lone Cyberman. Here we go. Three weeks after he was teased, he's here in the not flesh and... Well, some flesh. In the half flesh. <laughs> Here's something... This is weird to me. Episodes like Praxeus, which don't have any art shit ostensibly, were like co-written by Chignall. They have his name on them. This episode has Lone Spider-Man bullshit all over it. And Chignall's name isn't on it. There may be a reason for this. You mean because it was actually handled well? Well, <laughs> there is that, but there is a there is a strong feeling going around that Maxine Alderton is going to be a, and I quote, core writer for Series 13. Mm, that, okay. That's the word being used. So maybe she's almost going to be like a co-showrunner or something? I, I don't know. Uh. So maybe this was Chip testing the waters to see if she could handle it on her own. Let's find out in, like, a year. Oh, yeah. Don't bring that up, please. That's, that's depressing enough as it is. Uh, well, anyway, well, let's talk about something far yeah. less he, he grim looks, than that. He looks really cool, by the way. I, I like the look. The, like, the, the whole half-man, half-Cyberman design okay. is really good. Here's the thing about me and Cyberman, okay? The thing that makes Cyberman effective is the body horror. So you have shit like the incredibly dissonant scene in the uh, alternate universe Cyberman two parter where people get converted while do 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 oh no we on the way that was that was fucked up and brilliant right that was some good body horror shit dark water and death in heaven also really visceral horrific yes stuff but most of Doctor Who doesn't do that. Most of Doctor Who just treats them as, oh, look, it's these big robots that have the legacy appeal because they were invented in the 60s. Wow! Cybermen's! Bam! Boom, 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 kaboom! Zap, zap! Blow them up! Shit. It's well, a very strange decision to give him emotions. I, I, I like it because it's doing something new. Yeah. So it's mean, you know why they did it. They did it because of the whole Frankenstein allegory. Yeah, true. Hey, that almost that's, sounds that's like a Doctor Who is missing. I mean, <laughs> Ad Adam the the monster Adam can talk in the book, so why not have the Cyberman talk willingly in the, yeah. in this? I guess. I I like it. <laughs> I do think the actor does, does a really good job as the lone Cyberman. Patrick O'Kane is his name. He, he shows up some significant acting chops here. I like the fact that. Giving him emotion lets him have more range beyond, I need the thing, give me the thing. He gets to be, like, angry and yeah. petty and malicious and deceitful. It, he's oh, he's got malicious as hell. Range. I mean, it's not something you usually see from a Cyberman. This, is, this, is, this is, is Terminator vibes I'm getting from this guy. 
Does Terminator was sense malicious. of desperation from him. Like, he's desperate to get this thing back. No, so, I, I don't mean he's like the Terminator in that regard. I, I mean that he's he's a robot assassin sent back from the future to change the past. <sighs> so I, I guess so. I never thought of that, but okay. I think the, the writers were, were inspired by Terminator. It's past. not really changing the past. It's going to the past to get the thing to change the future. He literally threatens yeah. to rip open reality. That's changing the past. Well, that was that's that's his like you know desperate gambit thing I think, but he's still ready yeah. to change the past. Come on now. The point is, yeah, that's, I, I, that's still. Come on. The point is, I I do prefer the body horror aspect of Cyberman to big stompy robots. If I wanted that, I've got the Peter Davison Blu-rays on the shelf. I'll just throw on an Earth Shock or some shit. Oh yeah. Like, well, well, here's here's the thing though, Frez. You said this before where, you know, we've had those body horror moments where we've seen people turn into Cybermen, and that was obviously terrible. Yeah. Um, we've seen just the Cybermen where they were treated a lot more like, you know, basic robots, like you said. Mm-hmm. This time we actually... Well, before... to be fair, to be fair, we, Danny was kind of... Yeah, but here's the thing. He still had his face, and it was normal looking. Okay. This dude looks like he's been in there for so long, his skin has started to rot away. His Ugh. teeth are metal. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I, I see what you're going Yeah, like he's a bit more... You can see just how much changes and how much of the organic are integrated into the system. He's a pretty gnarly looking... That, that malicious the... grin he gives towards the end, my goodness me. He's wild. It's like, just think about... Every single Cyberman you've ever seen can do the exact same thing, but emotion. Yep. Do you know how this, okay. this Lone Cyberman was handled for me? And, and you might disagree, and that's fine. Go on. To me, this was this was like the Dalek was handled in resolution, but done right. So the Cyberman has these new abilities in this episode. The lightning thing? That's brilliant, isn't it? That's cute. I think that's awesome that he, he can recharge himself with the lighting. And again, that's inspiration for Mary because, you know, Frankenstein's monster is brought to life by electricity. Holy shit, I never well, saw that! <laughs> well, ex- except she never actually saw it. So. No, but that's that's the idea they're going with here. But, yeah. But, they're trying know, to frame yeah. the Cyberman around Frankenstein's monster. Well, yeah, that, that much is obvious. And, you know, as soon as he got struck by lightning, yeah. I was like, okay, yeah. this. Is but this, this is really dark. It, the baby, oh my god, the baby... I thought, when the doctor removed that blanket from the baby, just for a second, I thought the baby was going to be partially converted. God. I don't think Doctor Who could go that far. Oh, well, it went it went far. It went quite far in this one. We've got the sad man actually breaking necks. Yeah. No, no silly zappy electric effect for you. No, no, no. Just straight up smack, snap, gone. Wild. And the fact you don't see it makes it, makes it much... More impactful, I think. Well, I mean, again, you couldn't show it. She so. briefly screams and it's cut off, and that's just so much more effective. <sighs> I, I, I almost thought I heard the crack. Again, like, that I think could you, just you be... do hear a crack, but the screen you is cut off. It's like... You hear the crack. Yeah. Yeah. That could have been just your mind filling in the rest. Yeah. Also, Which also the, foot, the footman, the poor footman, is like, a, Are you the guardian? No, sir, I'm the valet! <laughs> That's his yeah. last words. Oh, and the worst part was Fletcher was freaking awesome. Too, yeah, Fletcher deserved better. He was. He was. Oh. When he offers to throw them out, he's like, like "Shall I throw them out?" So I said, "No, no, let them in." So, anything else about the Lone Siren Man? Should we talk oh, there's, about there's, that? There's, there's, a, there's a bit more. We've already mentioned the, the reference to Bill, haven't we? Uh, yes. Yeah. But no. I this this um, this take on the Cybermen, it's it's light resolution but done right. So the reconnaissance Dalek in resolution had a load of new abilities, didn't it? And we said back yep. then it didn't fit it. It was like they wrote I... it for another monster and then just oh no, we'll, we'll put the Dalek in its place. All the abilities that the Cyberman displays here are new, but they fit him. Hmm. They fit the race of they the Cybermen. If it's the theme too, yeah, it makes sense that they could charge themselves with uh, with the electricity from the outside. It makes sense that they can break people's necks. Yeah, plus um, the Cybermen are naturally made to adapt. Da- Daleks aren't. I mean, it took yeah. them forever to figure out how to go upstairs for one thing. 
Just think, if the, Sad, if the Sad Men had just had stairs, then they would have won the Battle of Canary Wharf, and, and this show would have been quite different. <laughs> oh, fuck. It's like that old story about the pens, how, like, the Americans spent, like, thousands of dollars trying to engineer a pen that could work in space. The Russians used a pencil. Yeah. <laughs> Although that's completely not true, because if the graphite broke, it would have caused explosions and fire. Yeah, like, but the, 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 the result being the Russians got into space yeah. first. Yeah. But, yeah, you, you get my point. It's like, I do. why you take the longer... But, the longer hey, thing? the Russians might have gotten into space first, but Americans landed on the egg first. Yeah. Jerry, you're not helping. <laughs> I like a cat didn't even react, and you're the one who's... Ah! Well, no, no, all I'm thinking about now is um, Americans don't really like soft-boiled eggs, so all I can think about now is... <laughs> <laughs> Oh, God. Speaking of resolutions, then, we have quite the resolution to this episode. So, the oh, Lone boy. Cyberman, the Lone Cyberman, which I keep this wrong saying is the Lone Cyberman, no. The Lone Cyberman, he starts quoting Percy Shelley. Mary recognizes her future husband's words, and at this point I thought, oh, God, is he actually Shelley? That's which what is I thought, too. Yeah, Cat thought this too. That's that would have been we an adult of the whole, you know, oh, we need to preserve history exactly as it is theme that we had going on. But I thought, okay, is it Shelley? It's not Shelley. <laughs> it might be better if it was Shelley, because what we got was far worse. So we find well, out. Well, I don't know. We find out what's I, I, behind. I will say, the I house. was a little disappointed because you hear the Cybermen start quoting poetry, and Mary goes like Shelley, and I'm like, oh, oh, it's happening, and then it turns to some floofy-haired Fabio motherfucker. And it's like, <laughs> Who the fuck is this? And then it turns out that was Shelley. It's like, oh. Unfortunately, I think this takes a bit of a of a of a, a downturn when Shelley shows up because he's yeah. the ghost. He's the ghost that's been moving all the objects around the house. He's thrown the vase. He's trying which to keep the sun means, man out. Which means when you think about it, an invisible Percy Shell holding a bone hand was throttling Ryan. Amy, you must We think, but we, we never saw him do that. Him. We never actually saw him I don't do think that. that was... They show okay, him. Okay, did it. Oh, by the way, that... Let, let, let's be fair. Let's be fair here. What are the Cybermen known for doing? They're converting humans. What is a skeleton but not a dead human? We know that they can convert dead humans because Missy did it. So, yes. I mean, it was quite obviously the Cybermen. Okay. okay. Well, arguably, when they're converted, they are they become dead. Hmm. Yeah, kind of both, yeah. Yeah. But, um... Oh, not, because they, he was able to save Bill, and Danny still retained some of his humanity, though he was he was still there. But um, the the bones thing, by the way, Lord Byron was a was a well known collector of bones, so that that tallies. Yeah, I mean that's not again historically accurate. But um, Shelley shows up, so he's been the one that's been manipulating the house and and uh, throwing objects and all that. And the minute he shows up, Mary loses nearly all her agency. Hmm. So that's the issue. Yes, an episode that was supposed to be about Mary Shelley becomes about her husband. Yeah, I can. Yeah, I, I can see where you're coming from. It's, so it's framed around her husband. That's valid. When it was very much like, oh, you know, it's, it's supposed to be about Mary what? Shelley until this extent, Lord Byron. No, it's all about Percy. I, I never thought of it like that, but yeah, that's, the women that's don't get to do anything of their own. Well, I mean, doesn't that kind of fit with the time period, too? I mean, hmm. it was a time period where, you know, women couldn't really write that. I suppose it does, it yeah. It, it just didn't sit well with me. I, I can understand. What I'm thinking of more is uh, this, uh, basically, the trolley problem. Oh, God, the trolley problem, yeah. Okay, this, is, this, is, this is some shit right here, okay? So, like, can I explain what a trolley problem is for people that don't know? That, I don't know what a trolley please. problem is. Explain the concept. Explain so the, the concept, concept is that it's a, it's a hypothetical um, scenario that there is a train or a trolley traveling at high speed on a track. There are five people lying on one track tied to it. And there is one person tied to the other track. The five people are on the track that you have to physically divert the train. No, sorry, sorry, no, the one person, you have to physically divert the train in order to, to make it go. The train's going to kill at least one person. That's inevitable. That can't be stopped. 
Troy problem, therefore, is do you pull the, the handle and save the five but kill the one? Or not pull the handle and kill the five but save the one? I, I think a part of it, too, is that the one person is usually, um, you know, your significant other or your sister or something yes. like that. And then the other people are <laughs> like strange. Yeah. I don't know the how idea, much I'm explaining it, but that's basically it. The idea think... basically is, do you, do through your inaction, do you allow people to die? Or through your action, do you sacrifice yeah, so someone I, I might have gotten the, the one of the five mixed up in the, in the order of where they are on no, the track. I, I, but... I, no, I, I, I think, yo, you're right, you're right. you got to divert to the one. In the yeah. Time. So I was, Honestly, I was right. it doesn't really matter because either way, you're still making the choice. Of, yeah. Do you kill one or more? Well, I think the idea of the trial problem is the more has to be from the inaction. Yeah. Well, I think the more is from the action. In this case, the more is from the action. Is it? Oh, yeah. In this case. In this case, the more is from the action. Yeah. I'm, I'm Googling well, the trail if, problem. If anybody doesn't here. know what we're talking about, just look online. There are so many memes about this thing, including yeah. multi attractors. And there, there, are, so, there no, are variants of it. Like, no, I think... no, no, no. I was right. I was right. The five are from in action. Yeah. Hang on. Okay. So I was right. That's that's uh, that's very pleasing. Uh, Hang on. I'm... Here, here. Oh, nope. That, just that JPEG. Nope. <laughs> oh, God. So, yeah, this, this whole Troy problem thing. And, you know, Ryan sort of plays into it by saying, you know, kill one and, and save billions in the future. But she, this is an impossible choice. This isn't really a trolley problem. There, there is a choice to be made in a trolley problem. To be Whatever fair, trolley problem. Whatever the doctor problem. does here, it's going to really screw things up. To be fair, a trolley problem is in itself an impossible choice. That's why it's a hypothetical... If she lets like, Shelley die, thing. if she lets Shelley die, that's going to potentially ruin <laughs> history from that point on to the rest of time. If she lets which, the Cyberman have the Siberian, which ultimately she does, in a roundabout way, she's doomed billions in the future cyber wars. Actually, <laughs> is this really an impossible choice for her? Because it's literally the past versus the future. That's exactly the future what I thought. Still be changed. I suppose hmm. the future one is a slightly less bad choice. And I mean... Well, when you think about the Doctor and all we've been saying about, in fact, how you were critiquing her for being a hypocrite in some sense, in that she says not to interfere. That's exactly what this Doctor would do. She would absolutely protect the arc of history rather than the nebulous future. Yeah. Yeah. But that, that's this, is, this, is an interest, this is an interesting uh, thing. I don't think it's presented very well. No, it's and not. It's kind of actually bizarre, but it gave me a lot to think about, and it reminded me of something else. Like, uh, it's her motivation really here is less. What am I trying to say here? Yeah, it's it's framed in a really weird, weird way with the Doctor's insistence on maintaining the current course of Earth history, such that it doesn't really end up being about what it should be about: saving one life versus. The billions, because it's like his Ted Cat. Ryan argued the needs of the many out the needs of the one, like this whole Star Trek thing. But if you watch the very next movie of those Star Treks after Rathacon, you see the reverse to that yes. choice. Yes. yes, we ignore all the ones that are odd numbered. I don't know that Star Trek Three is fine. It's we fine. ignore all the ones that are odd numbered in this household, young man. I'm I'm older than you. In this house, we obey the laws of thermodynamics. <laughs> <laughs> Look, we ignore all the odd numbers of the classic movies. We ignore the even numbers of the new movies. I, I don't know how I feel about the 2009 one. Beyond was pretty good. I am still up. mad about fucking Benedict Cumberbatch. <laughs> we all are. We all fucking are. But... The point is, the no, doctor... Not Cucumber Bandit Snatch, come on now, what's he doing that's so terrible? Someone has He was Star Khan! <laughs> no, okay. You but, make a good point. Carry, continue. But Ryan does raise that point, and the doctor, rather angrily for Jodie Whittaker, really shoots him down for it, you know? The whole speech about how she's on so much higher up the mountain that she is. like, wow! Holy fuck. Mm -hmm. Here's why I have to bring up something. 
Uh, reluctantly. I mean, I don't usually bring my own bullshit in the Doctor in the Doctor Who reviews, but I feel I have to in this case. I in 2018, I did a massive post about the anime Sailor Moon, <laughs> and it's 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 good. It's a lot like Doctor Who, and that it has the same in ideal sense. But the third season climax of Sailor Moon ends with a choice. Not unlike the choice the Doctor has to make here. She has a thing. The villain wants the thing to take over the world. Now, if she gives if she gives up the thing, there's a chance that everything is fucked. If she doesn't give up the thing, an innocent life will die. So Sailor Moon gives up the thing because she doesn't want an innocent life. But thanks to but it's Sailor Moon, so thanks to the power of love and friendship and all that shit. Everything works out. Because well, I mean, they, that, they all still die horribly. No, 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 no. Third season. You're thinking the first season. He's not referring to the first season. He's, I think he's talking about um, Mistress Nine. Yes, thank you. Yeah, you you're very knowledgeable. Uh, yes, I am indeed. I'm, I'm trying not to spoil it too much, but... She that's, gets why, that's why things. she said Mistress Nine and not something else. And not, yeah, not the, that, not the innocent person. And not... <laughs> yeah. Not there, yeah. But everything works out in Sailor Moon. It, it works fine, because that's just the kind of show it is. It's a show where that happy-go-lucky, utopian, idealistic stuff works out all the time. It is the correct choice. Yeah. That's kind of how I feel this should have been presented. It's presented as this impossible choice, but you got to move... If you move past... If you look past all that other bullshit about preserving the arc of history, one life... Versus billions, the Doctor will always choose the one life, as Sailor Moon would. Yeah. Now, that said, given that this is a Chibnall era, and not as hopeful a children's magical cartoon, the giving up the Siberian to the slow Cyberman is... is it's le- for children. Well, it's less everything is going to work out for the best, love and friendship, I'm going to believe really hard, and it's framed more as Right, time to sort out my fuck-up that I just forced myself into by standing up for my ideal. Yeah. I really hope that she doesn't get need for it so, too badly. Like, you would go to episode 9 and says like, Oh, you know, these people die. Ooh, feel really bad about it. Grim, 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 dark, 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 moody, moody, moody. I, I mean, we'll find that. out, but that's not looking particularly hopeful on that on that front. I mean, it's Dr. Who. I always have hope. I mean, this, this episode was dark as hell, particularly... You find out the mm. Cyberman's real name is Ashad. Mm. And he has this, mo- this heart-to-heart with Mary Shelley, which was a bit awkward, and, and the, the Mon Prometheus line was, was very, very forced. But um, mm. he's, she says, you know, you, were you a father? You, you spared, I said the man who spared my son, were you once a father? And he, you sort of think, oh, is he, is he going to be like, um, show his humanity? No! The complete opposite happens! Oh, he oh says, no, he shows his, he shows right, his humanity. Because he's weak right. and sickly. And I did have children, and I slit their throats when I joined the resistance. Jesus! Christ almighty. This guy is a willing cyber convert! God almighty. He's not a prisoner, he's not a victim. He did this to himself willingly. Well, he... let's be fair. There's also a little bit of how much of, of a reliable narrator is... Because he could have been converted, they just weren't able to put in the chip yet. So he has the emotions that the Cyberman would have, but not his own. So there's who knows? I don't know. But whether the or not he's telling the truth or not, just the idea that he might have slit his children's throats because they're on, on the wrong side yeah. to him—that's one of them. Don't cremate me, God. That's yeah. That's that's some fucked oh. up. But keep keeping in mind, granted that I trust the chip layer, but as far as I can throw it, the idea even in both Sailor Moon and Doctor Who, is that the uh, the night is darkest before the dawn. So Yes, true. This and could that, just be this could just be the lowest point this series. And then everything works out in the end. And that weak and sickly line, that really hits close to home when you realise that uh, two years after the vid for the Adati uh, scenes, that child was dead. Oh that's oh, oh that's so, fucked up. So he was okay. weak and sickly all right. Damn. Yeah. So anyway, the Doctor gets out of the, the Shelley predicament in a clever way. She pushes his mind to his future death. 
<laughs> and that's also dark. Okay. So Shelley now knows she's going to drown in, in six years' time. Okay, but like, hey. this is where things get a little. I don't know. Po- I don't want to say poorly plotted. Kind of questionable. The idea that the doctor and the side, the woman Cyberman, fight for the Siberium. The doctor gets it, and then the Cyberman's just like, "I'm gonna blow up Earth." And the doctor's like, "Okay, here, take it back." They they try to frame this as a second Troy problem, but it's really not. <laughs> It's, it's, it's really just, like... It's a bluff. It's op- yeah, it, well... The is doctor he bluffing blinks, or is he I mean, not? I don't think he was bluffing. But what we have here, and this is one thing I do love about this whole scene, this is the first time that this Doctor has categorically lost. Mm. This is not a victory, in any sense of the word. This is something that our friend Calamon, by the way, Calamon the Third, he's wanted to see this for a long time. Oh, ever since she took awesome. over. And to be honest, I think I want to see that as well. So we've actually got some some real cons and my god have we got consequences so if you look at the next week's episode. I wow. Would, I don't I don't know I don't know how far I would say the doctor lost because well she she did what she wanted to do. She made her choice and she saved children. She was told categorically, don't get the low side what it wants. She then gave the low side what it wants. Whoopsie doodle. I mean to quote someone earlier in this episode. You had one job. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, but like, consi- consider us. As soon as we heard that, Captain Jack's warning, you knew. You just knew the basic arc was, well, once we meet the Lone Cyberman, the Doctor's going to give it once. Yes, but I didn't think it was going to happen this, but just that quickly. <laughs> well, what kind of well, slow burn be, were you Let's saying? be fair to the Doctor here. Um, there was that part where they could hear each other through the walls, right? Yes. You know, like, they were talking through the fireplaces and stuff. What if this Cyberman could hear the Doctor speak to Ryan? And he knew how to play her to get what he wanted. Oh my god, that's a that's a brilliant read of it. Interesting. I like that a lot. So it's like, that's why he made that threat to start destroying things, because he knew that she would be willing to do just about anything to save the pack. Intriguing. I wonder what would happen if he said, if you don't give me the Siberium, I'll kill your friends. Probably the same thing, mm. to be honest with you. I mean, yeah. I, I mean, if you're again, again grabbing, again grabbing the Peter Davison blue shelf, that's just earth shock shit. Yes. <laughs> so anyway, the the Cyberman gets what he wants. He immediately teleports away. The Doctor's like, I've just done a terrible, terrible thing. But here's the plan. Step one: we give the Cyberman what it wants. Step two: we fix the mess I've just created. In step one. <laughs> <laughs> Exactly. That's that's what we're going for. We're going. She knows to, it's going to have huge consequences. Yeah. She doesn't know what the consequences are yet, but she knows she's just doomed a lot of people. Like, I, I, again, this goes back to what I like about the Cybermen and what I don't really. Like. The consequences are basically stompy, stompy, big, big war, kaboom. Well, we don't know that for sure. I mean, we didn't see that in the next time trailer. Well, we didn't see much of I anything mean, in the next time trailer, actually. But. Listen, listen, this this goes back to me not trusting Chibnall. It's going to be stompy, stompy, boom. Quite possibly. <laughs> Can I say one thing that's always kind of irritated me about Doctor Who? That this kind of has a play. Um, Go on. And that's simply when the Doctor arrives to and bad things are happening in an event because of problem. A. The Doctor solves problem A. By doing some whatever bullshit, usually with the Sonic or hand wave being smart. Mm-hmm. Why doesn't the Doctor use her time machine to go back before Problem A started and stop? Problem because A? she's part of events. Once she gets to the prop, once she realizes what the Problem A is, she's part of the events. She's part of events, and also yes, we wouldn't have a story if that so happened. She can alter that. So I don't know. It's just one of those things that you have a time machine. Use it. Yeah. Yes, especially since she'd used the time machine two episodes ago in practice, but that's besides the point. Anyway. Just, just briefly then, um, after the, uh, the Seven has got what it wants, the uh, the gang is sticking with the Doctor for now. They want to travel with her to uh, to go into the Cyber Wars and, and pursue a shard before he can do whatever he's trying to do with the Siberium. And then we get this um, this idea that the ghosts that Graham saw might actually have been real after all. That's never explained. I hope it's never explained. <laughs> Don't explain that. That's cute. I like it. 
Yeah, just fine. just leave that ambiguous. That's fine. Uh, and then the poem at the end, that's a real poem. Mm. Its name is Darkness. It really does contain the line, she was the universe. And as soon as they, as they heard about it, they thought, that's basically the Doctor. Put it in there. <laughs> and that's a nice way to finish it off. It's cute. Yeah. So yeah, let's just quickly uh, wrap this up and go to overall thoughts. Then I'll let uh, I'll let Kat go first. I mean, this is probably going to be sacrilege, but I liked it better than Tesla. <gasps> what? Oh, I didn't expect that. <laughs> I really did. I mean, if you're just watching it like I was, it's perfectly. It has that hint of mystery that you would want. It has, you know, like the themes that revolve around, you know, the, you know, Mary Shelley herself with the lone Cyberman being his monster, and, you know, just all the crazy shit that, in the sense of loss. You know, just the idea of what do you do in this situation? Do you sacrifice many? And I, I really like it. It's perfectly atmospheric. It's got those elements of horror that I enjoy and that I expected, which, you know, it's Mary Shelley, obviously you would want that. And I was even fine with the husband being the one who had the um, Siberium inside of him because I wouldn't want that to happen to Mary Shelley herself. You know, Mary Shelley, you don't do that to Mary Shelley. You do that to her husband. He's expendable. He's going to die. <laughs> wow. But it's, it's by all this stuff happening to Shelly that she becomes who she becomes. And I think that's more of a growing. Yeah. Hmm. But either way, this one is my top one and then followed for very closely by... T that's interesting. I didn't expect that at all, but that, that's extremely uh, interesting. I thought for sure this wouldn't beat Tesla for you. Well, no, it, it kind of... I mean, Tesla's fantastic. Don't get me wrong. Um, Mary Shelley is one of my other books that I have. People. The episode just really did everything justice. It, you know, it melded all of the, you know, arc elements and the plot elements of the story. Brilliant. Yeah. Can't say fairer than that. Uh, Jerry, do you agree or disagree that it's the best episode of the series so far? It's not, but it's still good. I like it, and for a lot of the same reasons Kat. It's very atmospheric. And it did, its elements did remind me of stories that I really like, like House of Leaves and Sailor Moon, of all things. <laughs> I mean, the, the, the weird trolley problem at the end is presented in a strange and off-putting way to me. It kind of makes me raise an eyebrow, but the general choice, I think, was still handled well. And I'm hoping that they don't needle the Doctor too hard for it. That we don't go full grim, you know, without a little bit of that hope. I mean, this is something that I've been working on for a while with the Magical Girl stuff. It's fine if you have it be grim and then subvert that and go, no, actually, we're quite hopeful. And I hope that's where Chibnall decides to go. But I don't know. But in the meantime, this is pretty good. I like it. It's like not, I don't know if I'd put it top three, but yeah. top half of the series, definitely. It's getting hard and hard to judge whether he's going to be on a, on a scale, really. Well, we'll find out in two weeks. I can give you a scale then if I, you want. I thought it was also uh, rather good. <laughs> it was basically an episode set up a big finale for the, of, over the next two weeks, but on its own merit, not a bad episode <laughs> at all. Uh, the writer... Can I, has... can I bring up one thing that I kind of predicted to a friend? Yeah. You know how I was talking about how Fugitive of the, the Jadoon was like Series 3 redone with all that yeah. stuff? This feels kind of like the utopia to the Cybermen two-parters. Yeah. Time Lords and Sound of Drums. Well, I hope so, because utopia was blooming excellent, but... Um... And this was pretty good, too. Fair, yeah. We've already discussed the fact that Chibnall does not have an original bone in his body. Yeah. <laughs> but, but, uh, um, yes, yeah. Please, your thoughts. It was to set the, the finale, but on its own merit, not a bad episode at all. 
Uh, the writer, Maxine Alderton, good debut for her, I thought. She knows the stuff about uh, this particular time period. The fact that she she's coming back supposedly in a bigger role, in a, in a bigger capacity for Series 13, fills me with some hope. Uh, Lord Byron, I thought, was excellent. Absolute highlight, close enough to his real-life counterpart. The Shelleys, uh, not so much. Uh, what should have been a story predominantly about Mary is overshadowed by the spooky goings on in the first act and then the lone side man and her own husband in the second. Speaking of the lone side man, he's a very intriguing and a, and a proper scary villain. Probably one of the scary villains we had in quite some time. Or I would say that if we hadn't just had Zelen, but... Um, <laughs> Maybe, again, episode order could have been slightly improved this year. But um, we need to learn more about uh, the Lone Side Man or Ashard next week. And I fear we might not have time for that. So this was a solid episode. They've all been particularly solid episodes apart from Orphan 55 and maybe Spyfall Part 2. Uh, but this is not a potential classic like Tesla was for me. Kat, it's great that you think this is better than Tesla. It's not for me. Maybe uh, future watches will, will change that. And I do... Worry that the uh, the two part finale might also have dragged this one down in hindsight as well, but we'll find out. So essentially, it's kind of like um, the pyramid uh, three. The mom. Oh Jesus! It, it, could, it could be possible that the next two will drag down the first. Because, yeah. You know, really good. Mm. Which is the best way I could put it, since you guys have uh, your reservation. Hmm. I'm You're glad right. that you like it a lot. Yeah, I just hope we enjoy it next week as well because next week, next time uh, we have Ascension of the Cybermen. It's the beginning of the end. And I, I, I've just noticed that this is basically just Rise of the Cybermen, but he couldn't use the word Rise, so he used Ascension instead. Oh, dear fuck. Christian has no original uh, bones in his body. All Cybermen. Next time on Doctor Who, bam, boom, boom, hey yeah. everybody, the trailer doesn't Cyborg. show much at all. The trailer doesn't show much at all. I think there's a brief shot of the, of the lone side man marching through a battlefield. There's two guys uh, holding each other at gunpoint, which is weird. Is is that almost going to be like a bit like the war games, like soldiers from different time periods plucked out of history? I don't think he's going to go there of all things. Imagine though, that's the cyber converts. Jesus. God. Um, other than that, yeah, we, we don't know what's going to happen. They've, they've kept this one very much under wraps. There's a stupid Cybership design that has got like, handles on it, like the Cyberman heads. Not sure how I feel oh, about that. <laughs> Jesus Christ. I have that, or it is a Cyberman head just floating in midair, but I think it's a ship. Mm. We are the Cybermen. We have peak aesthetic. Oh my god. <laughs> Jerry, why? <laughs> Jerry, why? Chibnall. Yes, but I can't yell at Chibnall directly. I can yell at you. So, Jerry, why? <laughs> yeah, All right. True. He's still not on Twitter, as far as I know. The coward. I I share your feelings. Be maybe maybe he's not going to get the cyber. He, he's not going to handle the cyber wars right. Oh, he's going to handle the cyber wars exactly as he, he probably should. You know, it's war. Ooh, bam, boom, bing. Like, mm. were the cyber wars a thing before this episode? I think they might have been mentioned in a couple of, like, old classic Doctor Who episodes, maybe. But they've, they've never been actually shown on camera. Not that I'm aware of. Oh, God. I th First I think they, what are you I think planning? They, I think they played into Earthshock. Like, that was the scheme of Earthshock, was they were going to crash a thing into Earth and kill everybody so that they wouldn't ally to stop the Cyber Wars or some shit. Yeah. Oh, so, Cat, nervous or, or excited about this one? It's, it's... It is very Terminator. Are you excited or uh, nervous about this one, Cat? I honestly don't know what this because there we kind of sort of resolved one plot point. We have, uh, you know, the others that we still have to deal with, with Ruth and Gallifrey. The master and all that bullshit, um, and we've only got like what two episodes left now to do so. <laughs> yeah. Oh. It's looking increasingly like it will not all be resolved. Captain Jack will come back. I think now Jack is not going to come back. I don't think there'll be there'll be room for him. I think that that's for a future appearance, either I in a special say... episode or series thirteen. 
I, I will say, if he comes back, then that makes his cameo a little less annoying for me in Fugitive. If he does not come back, that makes his cameo super annoying, because that means they're literally pandering to us. Yeah. I mean, they already were, to be fair. I am very oh, worried yeah, that we're not going to get all the answers. If, if he doesn't come back, then, you know, they literally just put him in to give one message fucks off. If, if Chibnall pushes... Follow. If Chibnall pushes this damn Timeless Child resolution to a third series, they'll be hell to pay, goddammit. Oh, Jesus. He has to give us something. Oh, he'll give us something. It won't be what we want, but he'll give us something. Oh, yeah. There will be an episode of television called Ascension of the Cybermen. It will air at 10 past 7 in UK time next Sunday, and we will come back next week and talk about it. We will, bitch. What we don't know is whether we're going to enjoy it or not. We will have some cheese with our wine. Ooh, that sounds good, nice. actually. That's poetic. That sounds great, we're actually. No, it's not supposed to sound great. DJ okay. In this, so. Okay, I, I was briefly thinking, like, that would be great for the podcast. And I thought, I yelled too much about bullshit already. You don't want me drunk while we're... No, I she didn't mention we're going to eat, eat cheese and drink so. wine. She meant cheese and wine, W-H-I-N-E. Oh. Okay, well, well, that we can do. That's the joke. Well, That's I can't the even joke. Because of my medication, so yeah. And not only is that the joke, that is the end of this week's podcast. So thank you to Freezing Inferno and Cat for joining me to talk about um, the Haunting of the Adiadati and the Low Side Men and Mary Shelley and all that jazz. Thanks. You're welcome. Yeah. Not a problem. Uh, thank you to you, the audience, for listening to us talk about this episode, and we'll see you next time for what we might be dreading, Ascension of the Cybermen. Until then, bye for now. Bring your Havarti. I wonder what he's going to do next. This is going to be something like the elevation of the Cybermen. The slightly above ocean levels uh, of Cybermen. Who knows?